First Minute Capital is a $100 million seed stage fund, sector agnostic, and proudly backed by a number of top technology founders, including 30 unicorn founders. The My First Minute series is about learning from prior generations of successful entrepreneurs and sharing their insights and lessons with the next generation of tech founders. The series has two focuses. One, how they got started in their careers, their first minute, if you will. And two, how they see the world today and what they're most excited about. My name is Spencer Crawley. I'm a co-founder and general partner at First Minute Capital. And today I'm speaking with Jeff Immelt. I'm not going to do your full bio intro because it might take up most of the 45 minutes. Um, but um, I do. Uh, I, I, I think everyone knows that you, you stepped down in, in 2017 after 16 years as CEO uh, and chair. You were the ninth chair of GE. Um, you joined the firm in '82, so 35 years into the company, and in you know you chaired task force, presidential task force for Obama. And Trump, you're a member of the board of uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Um, you've now sit on, I think, Robin Hood as well. Uh, I think Time, you were in there, 100, 100 most influential people in 2009 of the world. You have a story career, and there are so many things I want to ask you about, but I also want to make sure that we get lots of time for questions because we have a really amazing audience for you. Um, so perhaps, um, well, I mean, the thing that feels most natural to kick off with Jeff is, is, uh, is how is the US feeling uh, at the moment? We're all reading obviously about it with great concern. How, how is the atmosphere? Oh gosh, I think it's as tough a time as I can remember. You know, I'm old enough to remember the 1960s and the kind of turmoil that, uh, that you could face then. But I think the, uh, you have three things going on at the same time, any one of which would be uh, very difficult to deal with, but you've got uh, the global pandemic, which has had a big impact, particularly in cities like New York City. You've got another episode of uh, rate, bad race relations and, and just discrepancy in, in, in dynam socioeconomic dynamics. And you've got 40 million people that are unemployed. So when you think about it, Spencer, in our context, if you had any one of those things, it would be a terrible time. You know, to have all three at the same time, you know, you know in, in some ways they're commingled, but in some ways they have a root that, that's in and of itself. I think it's a real challenge for citizens, for business, for government. And uh, it's, a it's as challenging a time as I can remember. We're definitely going to come back on your, your thoughts of how we ease from lockdown for sure. Um, perhaps just on 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 what's the, the last few days. Um, do you, do you see the administration having handled it well? Like, what's your gut instinct on on how the next few days pan out? You know, I, I think that um, you know I don't want to I don't want to veer into politics too of course, greatly of course, right in the discussion. Of course. I, I always think that you've got to connect and be empathetic with people. Yeah. And that that's the way you form a common ground, whether you're in business or government. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's incredibly important for leadership right now and in a critical time is empathy. I think it's important that everybody has a chance to voice their rage right now. And that's very much a part of the American system and the American scene is the ability to voice uh, you, you, your democratic rage about things that you don't like, mm -hmm. but the complexity of helping African Americans or race relations or policing or education, these are going to be years and decades in fixing. And my fear is sometimes people view that, okay, I'm incensed, so I wrote a blog and I'm done with it, right? that's not gonna be good enough to actually drive the kind of change we need to drive. These, these are local, intricate, long-term actions that need to be taking place. And that's, you know, that's my hope is that, that's how real change takes place. Absolutely, well let, let's hope some of those long-term measures uh, accelerated at least uh, for, for now. But um, Jeff and I for, also forgot to admit and thank our friends at NEA for making this connection. So thank you to Andrew and York, but we're gonna, we're gonna talk lots about tech and venture. Um, perhaps if I may start with, with, the, with the my first minute of your, of your own career um, and you know, before 
uh, that that eighty two moment of joining GE, you were you were at HBS and you started at Procter Gamble, I think. Where you were? Am I right in saying you you and Steve Ballmer sat next to each other? Sat yeah, next to each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was it? What were, what were you like as colleagues? <laughs> well, we were the uh, least likely to succeed. I would say pretty much. Uh, we were we were still parting too hard and weren't serious workers at all. So I would say, uh, I would say Steve and I became great friends. We're friends today. Um, we, we shared, we worked on Duncan Hines cake mix together and uh, Steve went off to Stanford and a year later I went off to get my MBA, but we've stayed in touch over the years and are great friends. Who would have been more surprised that the other went to be a CEO of John? I think it's a great question. I think it's almost an equal, it's almost a tie I would say because uh, we closed more than one bar together. I, I, there's no doubt about that. <laughs> well, it, it was it was it because your your father, I believe, worked at GE. Yeah. And I know that wasn't how you how you first uh, got the link to the company. But how how what was the transition from HBS to GE, and how did that? How did you start your career? Yeah, look, I mean, I think it's a uh, you know I worked for a consulting firm the year be- between b- years of business school, mm-hmm. and I basically thought it was great, but I didn't want to go that path. I wanted to be an operator. Mm-hmm. And I thought I could join a big company and learn for four or five years and then figure stuff out. And pretty soon five years turns into 20 years. And, you know, some of it is performance and some of it's luck. And you just see how things evolve over time. And I always had good assignments and people that I liked and things like that. So that's, I don't think, you know, it would be weird to join a company and say, I'm going to be CEO someday. So I never really thought about that. But you know, I think I, I always wanted to be an operator. I always wanted to to kind of have this uh, hands-on experience with things. Mm-hmm. And I certainly had a chance to to live that life. Was, given you were a, a math major at Dartmouth, was was finance something you considered? Like, what was, what was the route almost taken if it wasn't GE? Oh, gosh. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think early in my career, you know, I was in sales in our plastics business. And I had a chance to really see hands-on entrepreneurs close up. And I think if I had done an off-ramp at any point in time during my career, it would have been to do something small and very uh, specific and entrepreneurial, but just, you know, always had other options and other paths. I never really wanted to be a finance uh, person or work on Wall Street or things like that. I think it's really you know, products, product management, technology, globalization, those were the things that kind of turned me on as I was building my career. Very helpful. And I think that that point on globalization is, again, something I would love to come back to. But yeah. the maybe, well, to fight, you, you were, of course, CEO of G's Medical uh, Systems Division, now G Healthcare, before becoming CEO of the whole company. The, the, it's well known that, the, that you stamped your own uh, style and, and substance to GE after, after succeeding Jack Welch. Um, what, what were some of the harder things to implement on, in, in, in day one where you had your vision for the company? Um, what, was, what were some of the, of course, the, 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 the huge event that happened four days after you became CEO was, was pretty, pretty relevant. But um, in, terms of, in terms of changing the company in ways that you thought was necessary and more focused and more global, what were some of the hardest things um, yeah, look, I think it's a, um, uh, instinctively, mm-hmm. and, and with my healthcare background, you know, I wanted the company to be more technical, more global, and closer to the customer, right? Mm-hmm. I, I was pretty sure that process tools like um, Six Sigma were good in and of themselves, but they weren't going to make us a more innovative company. Right, they weren't gonna. They they weren't really gonna help us grow, so I, I needed to pivot away from that. And then again, I think when you follow somebody famous, you know, you have to drive change while pretending that nothing was ever wrong, and and that's uh, that's always the most challenging thing, both inside and outside the company. Is uh, you know, you're you're always as a leader, you're you always have a sine cosine wave of perception and reality. Right. And your job as a leader and they're never in check. Right. And and when uh, perception is above reality, yes. 
that's really hard, right? And when, you know, reality is below perception, that's a little bit easier. And that's why you see so many CEOs, so many leaders when they come in, the first thing they do is kind of like trash the past. <laughs> and they try to reset, they want to reset perception below reality. And I, I've always been somewhat skeptical of those kind of pronouncements. And when you follow somebody famous, you really, you don't have that option that goes with it. So I think that's just something for all leaders to keep in mind. Were you ever conscious of stamp making your mark in, in a way that was almost o overly emphasizing the change of leadership and departure from the world? You know, not period? really, just because of what you said. I, I think if you think about the last 20 years, right? So I basically, from 1980 to 2000, these were pretty stable times. I mean, the world was at peace. Uh, the U.S. had a dominant position in the world. You could just go through that time period. From 2000 to 2020, you've had the rise of China, the rise of technology, the rise of, of uh, the global financial crisis. You know, I could go down the list. So, so I, I think we went from a time period of real stability to a time period of extraordinary volatility. So you didn't really have to stamp one way or the other. The world, the environment was just gonna take care of whatever you were doing or whatever you, you, know, whatever you needed to be or, or the things you needed to do. Of course, and I, 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 those, some of those macro trends, um, again, the, the particularly the one I'm most fascinated to hear your thoughts on as well as, as healthcare, given your deep, deep expertise, but just one perhaps practical sort of insight into what it was like being CEO of, of GE. You know, there are lots of entrepreneurs and CEOs on the line with thousands of employees, and, uh, but I think it's quite hard to picture what running a company of 300,000 people was like. Um, what, what was the, 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 the core of the day job for you? What, how, how, how does it work when you're CEO of a company of that size? Yeah, look, I mean, I think the, um, the rough estimate of how I would, you know, kind of roughly spend time is about 30% on people, 30% on growth, 30% on problems, 10% on governance, right? So 30, 30, 30, 10. That's the rough idea. Um, I had an infinite amount of work to do. So I never went home at night because my work was done. I went home because I was tired or I wanted to see my family or something like that. But the work is nonstop, infinite, and, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? So I think, I think for the people, a lot of the founders right now that, that are kind of, you know, dealing with the pandemic and stuff like that. I, I think really you need to kind of find ways to take control over your personal life, get plenty of rest, don't drink too much, uh, things like that. You need to find ways to get peace and, and, and find a way to think so you're not fighting fires all the time. And I think you just need to settle in for the fact that this pandemic, that we, that we may only be 10% through what's going to happen. So you just need to pace yourself as you go through it. And that's some of the things that would transition from where you are, you know, at a 300,000 person company to where you are at a 300 person company. The last thing I'd say is you really don't manage 300,000 people, you manage 50. Mm -hmm. and, and, you, and you need to find ways, whether you're a big company or a small company, you need to have people you trust who are really there to kind of uh, provide the right kind of framework and thoughts when you can't be all things to all people. Of course, and, and the, the pacing point, I think is such an important one, particularly in this time of people working from home and that separation is harder and harder. Um, so, you know, Spencer, from the day um, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt mm -hmm. until the bullets stopped flying, that was 15 months, okay? Of just pure fright, intensity and then the waves from that lasted a decade right so that's what i try to tell the founders i work with now which is pace yourself right don't 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 lose too many ideas early on and it's a conversation we were having which is you know now i i sit on boards with investors where i might be the only operator right mm -hmm. and and the ceo and founder kind of sits in the middle right and the investors all say look Cut once, cut now, cut deep, get it behind you, and then go on. That's not the way the world works, right? <laughs> what the operator says is, okay, 
I'm going to keep taking cards till I get a hand I like. I want to see what my options are, and I don't want to peel off too many options before I have to. And that's the difference between an investor and an operator. Now, somewhere in the middle, the truth is, but I think right now, founders, particularly founders with lots of investors on their board, need to find the right path so that they can review options as they come their way. That's Fascinating, and we, we've had very distinguished speakers talk exactly about that cut first cut early, and they were indeed um, technology investors rather than operators. But it, um, as you say, that balance is 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 the, the way to think. Global about financial it. crisis, guys, was twenty months. Okay, and if you if you took all of your issues the week after Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, you were out of gas. Yes. At the time you really had to navigate, uh, the water is getting really rocky. So keep that in mind. And with the, the, this crisis, and, and 9-11 was the event we obviously we alluded to earlier, and, and with the 08 crisis that you, that you weathered as CEO, what, what, when you look at where we are today, and you, you mentioned, alluded to it at the beginning, but what, what worries you most about the crisis that we're in now? Oh, I think business model destruction. You, you know, in other words, what I worry about now, Spencer, so, you know, I kind of think about, look, every company is in the healthcare business. So, so whether you believe it or not, doesn't matter what you are, you're now in the employee safety and healthcare business. Uh, there's been going to be a real merger between digital and uh, in the physical world, which is, which is uh, critical. But I, I worry deeply about, uh, you know, huge business model destruction of, you know, what's a retailer going to look like? What's an airline going to look like? What's a hotel going to look like, right? So I, I think there's going to just be this reordering of the physical and the virtual world, the digital world. And so if you're on the right side of that trade, hey, that's great. And if you're on the wrong side of that trade, it's really tough, really tough. And so I think that's that's something as I sit here now, which is, you know, something to, uh, to think about. Look, if you were sitting there in 2009, if you were a deposit taking bank, you might not have liked government regulation, mm -hmm. but there was a port for you to sail into, right? Mm -hmm. there, there, was a, there was a port for you to sail into. If you're sitting running an airline in 2002 after 9-11, you weren't so sure kind of what the, what the nature of the industry was going to be, security and things like that, but you had this bow wave of global demand, China and Brazil and Africa and things like that. You know, now if you're, you know, deeply in the physical world, it's hard to see when you pick your head up exactly, you know, where, where you're going to go next. That's why I tell people, look at industries like, look at the automotive, in, look at, watch the global automotive industry in 2021. Uh, if interest rates are zero, so basically cars are almost free, mm -hmm. if, if that's not enough to keep car demand flat, if it's still declining 10 or 20%, mm -hmm. we've got a real problem, right? It's not that everybody's in the car business, but it, it, it allows you to triangulate in terms of how people really view, you know, kind of assets and things like that. And, and, and with the business model disruption that you that you're concerned about you've obviously got a fascinating seat where you are now at NEA um, how does that inform what kind of companies you look at and you look for uh, look I mean I think the uh, you know in, in the healthcare services business right mm -hmm. um, th there's this ongoing theme about you know how many people are going to go to the hospital versus being treated at home that's going to be turbocharged mm -hmm. and telehealth, which has been, you know, kind of a hobby, I would say for 25 years now takes off. Right. So you've got, you know, how do I now merge service lines in a mm -hmm. hospital with some of the technology that's going to enable people to do healthcare or, or the desire to do healthcare in different ways. Those are going to be the kind of businesses that are going to be tremendously uh, opportunistic. I think on the, on the enterprise side, Resiliency now trumps productivity. I mean, productivity has always been the, let's say, the, the lifeblood of most digital investing. Resiliency now, okay, if I can only bring 100 people to work, they have to be as productive, physically, they have to be as productive as that used to be with several hundred people in the same location. What are the tools? Is it, is it RPA? Is it different ways to communicate? You know, those kinds of things. 
And then just the whole communication space, the whole kind of mobile communication space, I don't see that ever going back to, to the way it, it was before. People are just learning how to do new things using different technologies, and that's not going to change. And, and future of work, um, I saw your, your talk in, you know, with the Eurasia group last week. What's, what's your hunch on future of work and its most significant changes? Look, I mean, I think there's certain things that are for sure, right? Mm -hmm. Some of the things that are for sure is going to be uh, fewer people or, or, or more, fewer people in more places. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to have these big congregations of people in office buildings or factories or things like that. Uh, resiliency is going to be much more important than, than, like I said before, productivity and things like that. Uh, global supply chains are going to be reordered. So the notion that you're going to make something in Asia or Mexico, shipping around the world, I think they're going to be collapsed. So you're going to see more smaller factories located closer to markets. I think that's going to change. Um, but the issue of how do you get people, you know, how do you get uh, – Unemployment back down to three or four or five percent in the U.S. and whatever it is globally, I think that's maybe you know in addition to all the other problems we have, that's a very big problem. So I, I view that as being, you know, when all the dust settles here, that's going to be a real challenge. Absolutely, and it's it's um, yeah, it's not it's not easy to see uh, the way out of it in the next at least few months. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated, Jeff, what your reflections are on working with later stage tech founders. Uh, yeah, you, you sort of many uh, boards for, for NEA, I think Collective Health, which um, SoftBank led the Series E last year and, and Formlabs, who we know, the 3D printing company out of MIT Media Lab, um, uh, Desktop Metal. Um, but the, I saw Coke actually invested in... in yeah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, do, do you know them personally? Is that it? Was that? Was I do. Yeah, no, I think that they, they become great, you know, super strong investors and stuff like that. So, yeah, look, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the companies I join, I tend to want, I tend to identify with the founders mm -hmm. and, and like to work with them. And so I've got maybe 12 or 15 companies that I work with. And, you know, I, I, I again, I look for, are they willing to learn? You know, resiliency, right? I think that's, that's uh, super critical. critical. Uh, can they renew themselves and others? Are they, are they willing to kind of c continue that path? And can you deal with failure, right? Can you, can you deal with uh, the fact that things don't work? And so those are the things I look for and the people that I work with. And, uh, and it's great fun, right? And the companies that do the best, you know, they, they, they have a product market fit. You know, so they're, 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 they've got a nose for the technology and they build good culture. Right. And, and I look at, uh, look, I've, I've watched Salesforce almost from the beginning. Right. I've been able to watch 20 years of Salesforce.com. Right. And I think what Mark continuously has done is just understood the product market fit. And he's constantly willing to invest in people, invest in capability and, and raise the game from a standpoint of his own leadership and his own leadership team. And so what you want to see are the companies that can, can go on that path. And, you know, my heroes always were the ones that the entrepreneurs that scale, scale themselves, like, like Fred Smith at FedEx. I mean, I, I, I love Fred, right? He, he founded the company. He's still there today. He's still the most curious guy in the room and things like that. And, and so I, I find, you know, Jeff Bezos, I could go down the list of, who are the founders that really want to scale themselves as the company reaches 10 million in revenue, hundred million in revenue and so on? You know, what are those attributes and how can I be helpful to, to the, those men and women as they're doing, going, going down that path? And, and given that importance of culture, what is your advice to the many founders listening of, of some of the practical ways to think about building a really robust and cohesive culture in their companies? So, I, I mean, I think the presence of, you know, I, I think good leaders building good cultures, they, they leave their imprint no matter how big the company is. And it doesn't mean that there's one way to do it, but they create an aura that is, that is um, you, you know, that people can always feel their presence. They know how to develop talent. So, so they, they care about the human resource side of the company. So, so I, I would say, you know, kind of aura, developing other leaders and managers is critical. Mm -hmm. 
finding their own systems of accountability, right? How do they, how do they drive, um, uh, you know, kind of like uh, over and over again, the kind of accountability that you see in a place like Amazon or other, other tech companies that are out there. And I'd say, I'd say the, the, the last thing is they, they kind of dominate the, the communication in the schools, right? So, that, so they go to the grassroots and they know how to communicate, but they also know how to train. So, so those two kind of foundational points, even if you're a small company, can be really, you know, critically important. You know, I, I look at companies that are doing, that are going through these horribly tough decisions uh, today, right, in the pandemic. Mm. And the best leaders do all of the hard stuff themselves. They do the layoffs, they do the communication about the layoffs, and they don't hide from any of those things that, that have to be done. But I, I would say, look, I, I learned working for a really good leader in Jack Welch about, you know, kind of aura, how do you instrument a company? How do you focus on frontline managers? And how do you both train and communicate? And I think those are the kinds of things that you have to continue to work on. How are you most different uh, as a CEO in 2017 than 01? You spoke about the perception and the reality and the cosigns. How, uh, in what ways did you evolve most, do you think, as a, as a leader in your- Yeah, I think when I, in 2001, I thought that I could control things. By 2017, I realized I couldn't control anything. That you're basically in the risk, in the risk management game. You're not in the yeah. not in the controls game, because you know China was on the scene, technology is on the scene, uh, government felt differently, much differently about business in 2017 than they did in 2001. And so I, I think leaders understanding that that they don't they don't control things. That's really, that's really critical. Like, like it's nobody on this, on your, on your call today, Spencer, it's nobody's fault. That's the, the pandemic. Some of you, it's going to hurt worse than others, uh, but it's not your fault. You can't control it. But what you can do is you can make your company as good as it can be given those conditions. And some people, just the uncertainty and ambiguity just freaks some people out. And today, if you can't handle ambiguity and uncertainty, you probably should find something something else to do. Well, they're, they're, uh, you, you've teed me up perfectly in, in mentioning China because um, I, I was fascinated to get your thoughts on, on A, what it was like doing business in China because that was obviously a, a central. I think when you started as CEO of GE, 70% of the business was US and by the time you finished, 70% was outside the US. Um, well, let's start with that. What, what was 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 because uh, I know you're still obviously heavily involved and, and have thoughts on, on on the U.S.-China relations at the moment. But um, what was your experience of building building very large businesses in China? Yeah, look, so I, I had an early start, Spencer. So I I basically started going to China in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. I had worked in Xi's plastics business, which was an earlier uh, an early investor in China. I led our healthcare business, which was you know, a, uh, an early investor in China. So but the, I, I had a great, let's say, contextual perspective. And very early in my career, I, I basically pegged in my own mind and therefore in the company that the Chinese market was going to be as bigger, bigger than the U.S. someday, right? So you just need to put that in your mind. And whatever you think about the politics or whatever you think about anything else, and and, uh, you know, I don't agree with a lot. And I see that I've seen change over time. It exists and it's going to be a huge market. It's a huge market for aircraft and healthcare, power. I could go down the list. And so I ran the company accordingly, right? I, I ran the company like saying this is going to be uh, a second huge market for a company like GE. So let's get good at it. Let's hire local people, let's hire, make local investments, like let, let's, let's build local teams. Um, early on, you know, intellectual property and things like that, hugely critical, very difficult to protect when you're in China. But this is a country that's graduated more engineers than the US and Europe combined for like 25 years. And so when you get to things like artificial intelligence or added manufacturing or things like that, China's very proficient today. So I would say I always leaned in. I spent a lot of time there myself. Uh, I had a workforce of almost 25,000 people, mainly Chinese nationals, mainly local people. And, and uh, it didn't all work, 
But over time, I feel like it's important for all of us to recognize that this is an economy and a country that's not going to go away. Uh, the role in the world that is profound. And, you know, they're just, I think you're better off helping your people become comfortable doing business there than just saying, I don't agree, so I'm not going to go. No, and, and, and one thing I'm always struck by, we, at first minute, we had Tencent as an investor and, and Ling is, is on the call, their, their chief European representative. Um, but, but I'm always struck by the asymmetry of how much the Chinese understand uh, European and US technology and the companies and the detail and, and the lack of, uh, you know, understanding the other way um, uh, in terms of our uh, sophistication of understanding uh, Chinese tech in particular. Um, I'm just with uh, any AI for anyone who doesn't know are invested in, in ByteDance and, and TikTok. Yep. Does, does, do, do you guys look to learn a lot from what, the, what, what, what models the Chinese technology companies are developing? Is that an area both in healthcare but also in, in many of the other areas you, you touched on? Yeah, let me make, let me make uh, two comments. Just to your point, first of all, you know, kind of the, let's say that all of the infrastructure technologies in China came under the organization called the NDRC, right mm -hmm. inside China. The NDRC knew everything about GE and Boeing and Caterpillar and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. In a way that if you went to Washington, D.C. and met with the Secretary of Transportation or Energy or stuff like that, the Chinese counterparty knew much more about our company than even people in Washington and Brussels. So they do their homework. The second thing I'd say, Spencer, is we're just gonna be in a time period where you're gonna have two large markets moving in parallel without a lot of connections in between. I, I just think that's where the world is today. So China will continue to make progress, but if you wanna be in China, you better partner with Chinese investors, work with Chinese companies and see how they're gonna grow. And so we're just gonna have this time period where you're gonna have I think uh, less commingling of funds and, and technology. So I, I think it's important for firms like NEA to have China investments, but you have to look at those in terms of how they're gonna do in the local market, not necessarily all the time where they're gonna go around the world and vice versa. But believe, believe me, the Chinese market's gonna continue to be vibrant and strong and develop great companies, particularly in the tech space. Of course, of course. I have um, we, questions are flowing through, and I know we have one from from uh, Victoire and Martin and Uma and several others. So I'll come to them in in, in just one moment. Um, where where will your first flight be post lockdown, Jeff? Where's that? Where's the first trip? Do you think I'm going to? Uh, you mean outside the U.S. or in, in the U.S.? Uh, both. Yeah, in the U.S. I'm going back to California, so I, I'm I look forward to going back there, and kind of outside. I I want to go back to um, I want to go back to China. I want to go back and see how it's changed post-COVID. I talk to old colleagues of mine weekly because I think they give you a pretty good sense for how the economy, how this economy might reopen because China's kind of reopening maybe one month or two months ahead of time. And personally, I, like I understand the geopolitical complexities and we live in a really difficult time in terms of global geo, geopolitical relationships. But I think if you're a business person, um, you know, China's not going to go away. You, you, you better have a good understanding. You know, you know Spencer, I, I think I told you earlier, I teach at, uh, at uh, Stanford, right? So I, I, I get a new crop of MBAs every year. I tell them, look, it doesn't matter whether you're American or European, your president, whoever they are, they're not going to protect you from anybody, right? You may, you may talk about protectionism and stuff like that. But in the end, the economy is still a pretty global enterprise and you better understand where your global competitors, where global markets are. And I think that's what the next generation of global business leaders have to, have to kind of understand the nuance of each market. Fascinating, and I, and I uh, you, the, the series uh, that Jeff is, is running partly is, is bringing in uh, global CEOs into GSP and, and speaking to them. I, I almost wonder whether you weren't copying my first minute, Jeff, but um, anyhow, um, <laughs> um, but talking about- that <laughs> I, I kind of leave that to you. <laughs> uh, about their early days and their, and their successes. Last one from me, because I, I you, touching on two points you made around the different perspectives as operators uh, and, and investors, and also, I loved your answer around that dealing with ambiguity and, and that of evolution as a CEO. Um, what struck you most about the best VCs, the venture capitalists that you've come across um, in terms of skill sets or outlook or anything? 
Yeah, I, maybe you let, let me let me pick two things because I think they're both important. I think I think one is the best VCs have a really good pattern recognition of what makes good leaders, and, mm-hmm. and they they're able to track the leaders around company by company, and they can curate companies built around leadership teams, and they have a real eye for that, which I think is great. Mm-hmm. And the second one is I, I think just tolerance of failure. It's it's just the ability to kind of recognize. And you know, you think it's BS when you come in, but you but you actually see the fact that uh, people know how to work their way through problems and 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 things like that. So I, I think those two things, the best VCs, uh, the best VCs have. And you know, I, I think that's uh, those come from experience, but it also takes a certain kind of person who's willing to kind of keep going uh, uh, and and keep learning and keep renewing themselves. Yes, I think it's not the industry. If, if you like being proved right the whole time, I wouldn't recommend uh, venture capital to anyone. And now turning over to Q&A. Victoire was um, head of investments at Group Artemis, the, the Pinot family and, uh, and caring uh, owner's investment arm and now runs a, a separate family office. Thank you, Spencer. Jeff, hi. Um, you had a strong view on how to take GE at the time to its new stage. And uh, I was wondering, how did you share and communicate your real bold strategy to your managers and employees? Yeah, so I think it's a, it's a great question of just driving change. And I think the first part is you have to not take on too many tasks. So I think over, over the course of my career, I learned how to do fewer things and be more disciplined around the changes that you ask people to take on because uh, I think confusion sets in when you have too many initiatives, too many going. And then I think what you have to do when you really want to drive uh, considerable change is you have to find ways to make it existential, both in terms of the type of people you hire, but the amount of accountability that you drive uh, in big organizations. You know, in big organizations, momentum matters. And so you have to develop this task of listening, but, but always moving forward, you know? So I would like, you know, one of the big changes I drove was globalization. So we went from a company that was 30% outside the U.S. to 70% out of the U.S. And, and we, we developed big uh, businesses in China. So I would be listening to the team and the team would be pushing back saying, Jeff, you don't understand if we do this in China, they're going to take our technology. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. And I would say, just go. And then after the meeting, I would take the person back and say, okay, tell me what you mean. <laughs> let me understand. <laughs> because I couldn't let anybody see that I wasn't like 100% all in. And so I think what you learn how to do, sign right people, the right metrics, find ways to make sure everybody's all in, but at the same time, allowing for inputs you know, so that you don't screw up too badly too many times. And I think that's the, that's the key. Hey, Jeff, uh, good to talk to you here. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, setting the stage for us. I want to follow up on the question you just answered on take on fewer number of tasks. So as a CEO, uh, founder CEO evolves, what are the functions you think should always be directly reporting to the CEO at all stages of the company? I mean, this reflects on culture. So... I uh, really would appreciate your input here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a great question. I, I, I would always, I'm showing some of my bias here, but I, I would always say that, like, you have this trilogy of CEO, CFO, human resources. And the one thing I see broadly in Silicon Valley, and I see lots of tech firms, is they really diminish the role of HR. And frequently you'll have HR reporting to a chief administrative officer or buried down in the organization. And I think if you want to build culture early on, if you want to build team early on, if you want to build talent early on, you need to find a way to elevate those uh, capabilities inside, inside the company. I think if you're a legacy company, the other one that I would add, where I think we, we missed the boat is uh, the CIO, the chief information officer. I think too many legacy companies treated those people as clerks buried them down in the organization. And now it turns out digital's everything. So you have to catch up in a, in a, very, in a very big way. But I, if I would give you one piece of advice for your, your startup companies, 
elevate human resources, get them direct reports to the CEO, and make them, you know, kind of a, a core part of the culture and the team. Well, thank you. Um, and I, as probably everyone knows, um, uh, Uma raised an, an extra 160 million in, in January for, uh, for, for Memphis. Um, so a very relevant scaling question. Um, a few more from, from I think, Robert. Uh, I will unmute you. How do you look at um, the opportunity for businesses in China, given the fact that uh, in order to grow sustainably, you need to be an open and democratic uh, company? Uh, what is the threat for companies in China, given the fact that this is a more or less closed society? You know, it's, um, it's by definition backward looking, but, you know, I, I ran a set of businesses that were in excess of $10 billion in revenue and 25,000 people, two research centers, multiple factories and joint ventures, uh, big market shares in healthcare, big market shares in aviation. And I really never had any problems running the business in a way that uh, we wanted to run the business. So I, I think, Robert, the key is if you're going to be a part of the Chinese economy, you have to go there at, and become an insider. You have to be willing to build local teams and make local investments. And you have to work on your own relationships with the government or with the, you know, both state and, and, and the national government in, in China. It's not, it's not for the faint of heart. It's not easy, but uh, over a long period of time, you know, I, I, I always found a way to get done what we needed to get done uh, in China. Okay, many thanks. Can I extend the question also to give you a perspective on uh, business in the Middle East? Have you got any experience there? And given the fact that they have essentially uh, huge deep pockets and are investing in lots of areas uh, these days, uh, what's your perspective on them as a partner in the business? It's a great, it's a, it's a great question. I, I think if you want to do business in the Middle East over a long period of time, you have to understand both the local needs that they have, but also the pivot that they have to go as countries as time goes on. So if you take, I'll just pick the kingdom, you, you know, the, the Saudi Arabia was a big consumer of jet engines and healthcare products and gas turbines and all the stuff that I used to sell. But at the same time, they were trying to pivot their economy to be uh, more entrepreneurial, uh, more local businesses that were founding and things like that. And so what I always try to do is find a ways to win the businesses that I, I needed to win in the local market, but also find the right partnerships to localize capability and find ways to hire local talent, uh, invest in, lo build local investments, and be again part of their, uh, the fabric of the world. So let me just elevate, because you're asking really great questions. I think about Globalization, I think, are important. Yeah. You know, so I, I basically, I'm 64. Most of my career was built on the U.S. as the center of the world. We did trade deals. You know, I used to go to China, and my first visit would be with the U.S. ambassador in Beijing, and then the doors would open and things like that. That's not today. <laughs> those, days, those days are long gone, okay? Now it's country by country understanding nuance, doing it on your own, building the right partnerships and local capability. And, and we're going to be in that world for a relatively long period of time. You know, I, I think there's a, there's a mistaken impression that President Trump ruined globalization. Globalization was falling apart long before President Trump. Okay. And I think for guys like you, Robert, the ability to build those strong local strategies, country by country, and picking the ones that matter most are really key. Yeah, great, great answer. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. We will seamlessly glo go from globalization to uh, biotech. Um, Alex Ravaronkov is the founder of Insilico Medicine, which is AI for drug discovery. Uh, thank you, Spencer. So hello from uh, China. Uh, I, I have a very provocative and futurist question, actually. So. Uh, you know that aging in general is contributing quite negatively to the global economy right now. So many economies become unsustainable. 
uh, with the number of people uh, retiring and uh, essentially exiting the workforce uh, and contributing significantly to the uh, kind of burden uh, on the healthcare sector. So uh, currently we see quite a bit of progress on kind of emergence of the longevity biotechnology industry. So we now can diagnose uh, uh, diseases early, but we can also track the you know, rate of aging. And uh, there are some early interventions. So what would be your futurist view for the next 10 years or 15 years in terms of you know, the future of longevity biotech? And in general, how long do you expect to live and uh, when do you expect to retire? <laughs> so uh, let's say, you know, again, technically I can't go deep. But I've been a profound, uh, I've watched over, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty deep healthcare guy, mainly more in services than biotech. But I, I'm a really firm believer that the, the science and technology is going to continue to just progress by leaps and bounds, right? And, and, and I see that. I, I think it's very hard to regulate against that, right? So I, I, I just think that's going to continue to go, number one. Number two, as a human, I'm rooting for you. Okay, so hurry up. I want to, I want to keep working. I want to keep living. But, but the, Alex, the point I would make to everybody that's on today is I, I actually think healthcare is going to be 30% of the U.S. GDP. It's where most people are going to go to work. Uh, I, I think we, we're going to have to shift our thinking about how we view healthcare as society as people age from one of saying this is a huge burden on the country and, that's, and that can't be withstood, to say basically in five or 10 years, 30 or 40% of the people in any country in the developed world is gonna be going to work somewhere in the healthcare sector, right? And, and I just think that's, that's where people have to, and particularly the pandemic I think is gonna accelerate that. That's where people are gonna have to change their thinking about healthcare. You know, Alex, I graduated from school in 1982. And if you had gone to work in the healthcare industry in 1982, you would have had a good career, whether you were good or bad or no matter what you did. I think the same thing's true today. It's, it's still the most investable sector. There's more science and freshness around it than just about any place else. And so hurry up, Alex. I want you to succeed. <laughs> We'll go next to someone who might have helped out with uh, Robert's answer of uh, 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 last question on, on the release, but Penny's a partner at SoftBank uh, and runs there globally. Uh, Penny, uh, and is a great friend, over to you, Penny. <laughs> thank you, thank you, first of all, Spencer, for including me today. I know this was a hot ticket. And uh, Jeff, I'm going to apologize in advance because we're going to go from the sublime to the mundane here. But when you uh, mentioned bite dance, of course, we are also allocated there. And it just made me wonder, as a fellow American, um, do you think that the U.S. is getting CFIUS right? Um, and if you don't, which I don't, but I, I don't know how they could they can fix it. And then secondly, are you concerned at all in making Chinese uh, investments with some of the legislation, for example, uh, in front of Congress now about um, limiting Chinese ADRs? I mean, what does that mean for liquidity? Yeah, Penny. So look, I, I think you ask a really, a really great question. I, I think clearly, you know, I, again, I have a pretty good 30 or 40 year perspective on China, US, particularly in the economy. It's as bad today as I can think in that time period. So I think as an investor, when I put my investor hat on, I think we all need to be cautious today about you know, what are gonna be the actions and reactions of one country to the other. And, and so I think in the short term, you, you have to be cautious. If you're, if you're investing other people's money, you have to be cautious. Let's take a big, let's take a, a bigger view, right? If you take a bigger view, China's an amazing market. If you're a healthcare investor or a tech investor, China is interesting. They have huge needs. There's going to be big companies built there. So, so look, if I, if I were back, if I were 30 years old again, and the company I worked for said, we want to move you to Shanghai to build a business in China, I would go. Because I, I just think it's, it's, it's a... Uh, vibrant, important economy. And the last thing I would say, Penny, really as an American, as a proud American, you know, if we, if we get through this pandemic and the world economy is really in tough shape, do we really want the two biggest economies in the world at war? 
You know, do, do we really, is that, if the question is, how do we get econo global economic growth? Is the answer a trade war between the two biggest economies? I don't think so, right? So I think my, my, my hope is that, uh, is that we ultimately find the right, you know, strings of, of communication that matter. The last thing I, I would say, like, if you believe in global warming like I do, um, the answer is going to be in China, right? It, it's, not, it's not necessarily going to be the U.S. or Europe or Germany that solves uh, climate change. It's going to have to be China that does that. So, so a lot of, there's a lot of reasons why our connections should continue to be strong on a global basis. Agreed. Thank you. Hi, Jeff. Thanks. Thank I'm you. enjoying listening to what you have to say. Um, just a question, uh, seeing what might happen in the future with uh, substantial remote working, um, how does one create and maintain a culture when, you know, most of your staff may be separated from each other and may never meet each other? It's, this is a super good question, I think, because one of the things I'm asking my companies to do is really track how productive we really are remotely and really understand what is the strength and weakness of, of kind of this world that we're living in right now. You know, my own belief is that you're gonna ha we're gonna have to reattach ourselves post pandemic. And that there are certain parts of running a company that has to be done in physical presence. And the sooner we discover what those are, the better off we're gonna be. I mean, the, I could give you an easy answer to say, you gotta communicate more, you gotta find ways that, to, you know, kind of allow you to build the right context with each other. But I, I think that's naive, really. Uh, the fact is, is that Zoom is an incredible tool. We're learning every day how incredible these tools are, but we're missing something about culture that comes from physical connection, seeing people in the meeting. And I think it's good for you to start logging right now, what are you missing? about, about uh, you know, one of the things that could make a big company small, every month for 12 years, I'd bring one, a vice president to visit me over a weekend with their spouse. We would go out for dinner, we would spend a full day together, and I would say to them, tell me about the company, tell me about yourself, what would you do if you were me? Uh, and I would give them a full discourse on how I viewed them in the context of the company, physically. That's how you build culture. You know, it's kind of like one by one by one by one. So I would urge everybody on the phone to be thinking while we're in this lockdown, what can be done virtually, but what do you still want to have done physically? And make sure you don't give up on that because I think we're not going to be building great companies unless we do that. Great, thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much for taking Great. the time. I really, really appreciate it. Great to um, be here. Good luck. Good luck to everybody. Super. And Andrew, thank you for making it happen. Thanks. See you guys. Cool.